Welcome to Colony TV, the governmental educational channel for the town of Colony. Welcome to So Many Books, So Little Time. My name is Joe Nash. This is show 32. I'm here with Zena Shevchik. We are both librarians here at the Colony Library. The premise of our show is very simple. I'll go over in case you've never seen our show. <laughs> Zena and I go down to the new bookshelf here in the library, and we go back to our technical services department where all the new books are being processed, and we've brought up a whole bunch of books to tell you about. We never get to them all. Today I'm going to try and get through several, Zena, more than usual. So <laughs> I put up I'll a lot. I'll try that too. That means I'll tell people we get books every week. We probably get over 100 books a week in at the library on all kinds of topics. So what you're going to about to hear is only a smidgen of what is here. So Zena, you can go for it. We're laughing because we can't believe uh, this is our 32nd show, I know. right? <laughs> you just can't believe it. And we tend to pick out uh, not necessarily the best sellers or the ones that are um, most popular uh, or most people know about. We pick out things that uh, people may not know about. And my first book is one that uh, I think a lot of people might be interested in. It's called The Big New Yorker, the magazine, Book of Dogs, Big Red volume. And uh, the New Yorker uh, magazine, uh, as many of you will know, have wonderful essays and works of fiction, short fiction, and maybe they're most well known for their cartoons. So this book is uh, full of all of that, cartoons, poems, uh, essays and works of fiction, short works of fiction that have been previously published in the New Yorker. But this is all, all of that uh, surrounds the topic of dogs. And I have to, in the, in the spirit of full disclosure, I have to tell you that I am a cat lover. I have never actually owned a dog on my own, but uh, I just absolutely love this book. If you want to feel good, you should look at this book. Um, it has, it's divided into chapters, good dogs, bad dogs, top dogs, and underdogs. And just the cartoons themselves are worth picking this book up. But it, it has, I'll just give you a smattering, there's an essay here, I'm not going to say the name of the uh, article because I would be swearing, but this article is about Leona Helmsley, who left her fortune. She was a real estate uh, mogul, hotel uh, heiress, um, billionaire in New York City, and uh, when she died, she left all of her money to her dog. And so this is an essay about that. There's an essay about Cesar Mal Milan, who is the, um, who's had his own show, The Dog Whisperer. There's a book, there's a, a work of uh, nonfiction about a New Jersey dog that was condemned, condemned to being uh, euthanized because he supposedly bit another dog and how uh, one of the writers saved uh, that dog and sneaked him into his apartment in New York C City. There's an essay about dog snakes sniffing dog or drug sniffing dogs um, there's articles by James Thurber Malcolm Gladwell it's just full of fun and informative um, essays works of fiction cartoons highly recommend it for a good good laugh anytime read it in pieces the big New Yorker book of dogs oh. now I looked and we have a New Yorker book of cat cartoons okay. but it doesn't have essays and poems no, and a, but I would say seeing that that's in the New Yorker is that heavy on cartoons no it isn't oh, okay. it's actually it no right. it's mostly uh, okay. you know prose okay so it's excellent and it's let's see when we get it November okay so here all right my first book I have only read and heard really good things about I mean really tremendous things not just your oh this is a good book this book is by Douglas Smith is called former people the Final Days of the Russian Aristocracy. It had an amazing review in the Sunday New York Times, I don't know, a few months ago, maybe last fall. 
I may, and I've, I've already uh, ran into two people that read it and said it was absolutely fantastic. It's all about the waning days of the, uh, obviously, the Russian aristocracy, and then dealing with two, um, two Russian revolutions, what, 1905 and 19, 1917. 1917. And it, it, it basically follows the end of an era, because that the Russian aristocracy was in power for I don't know, hundreds of years, and Russia was a big, what's it was epic in scope, the country, you know, the empire and all that. And it follows um, the decline of the Russian aristocracy through two families. Um, they are, I just had it here, the Shurometatevs and the Golitsins. I'm probably not saying that right. Shurometatevs. Hmm. Wait. I'm just admitted, a, yes. I'm, I'm laughing. But anyway, it goes through all, you know, Russian history is absolutely fascinating, particularly once it hits the 20th century. So this book, um, and apparently it, I, the two people I know, the woman who used to work here read it, she just brought this back, said it was absolutely fantastic. And my wife's sister read it and said it was fantastic. And like I say, wow. a great review. And it, it goes, I think it follows the families. Of course, the Tsar's family was, they were um, murdered. They were murdered. And I think it follows these two families. I think some of them survive. It is, it, is story, it is sort of a story of survival also. And I think it goes up into World War II. But it goes into all that history. The first 25 years of Russian history of the 20th century is you know, fascinating. It's a you know, big, gigantic country and all that went on. So in all the reviews I read for this book, besides the ones I just mentioned and the two people say that this book is really great. And I think um, on Amazon, all the reviews were five star, or almost all of them. Wow. So that's Douglas Smith, Former People, The Final Days of the Russian Aristocracy, if you would like history, yes. Well, my uh, ancestors, I come from good old yes, Russian peasant stock, <laughs> not from the aristocracy, so. Well, I think the peasants are mentioned. In the <laughs> yeah, 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 the many more millions <laughs> of the Russian people. Um, I just, as a segue, um, I, there is a, a book uh, we just received just on dog cancer. It's Dog Cancer Survival Guide, and it's a it's a pretty substantial book. And you can tell I, I'm sorry about my little yellow uh, slips uh, marking the places where I thought there was some special information. Um, it's really uh, in depth discussion about uh, making healthcare decisions for your uh, pet, your dog, uh, when they have a diagnosis of cancer. Um, it's, it's really detailed and it talks about not, um, the usual treatments that are available, but very uh, uh, many alternate treatments as well. It includes things like uh, meditation and massage. It sounds uh, too um, new age for some people, I suppose, but the way it's presented here, uh, in a very uh, authoritative manner. Um, I thought it was very interesting to see what's available now for uh, people uh, to try with their, with their animals to extend their life and their quality of life. And it discusses uh, you know, the different breeds and their, their uh, tendency towards certain cancers. And it talks about diet and uh, all sorts of other things, but the, uh, the full spectrum of what actually is available. Uh, for your pet um, that's been given a diagnosis of cancer. But that I, uh, segues into this book, which is what I'm, I really wanted to talk about, the Mayo Clinic Breast Cancer Book. Um, it's, this is fantastic. Uh, uh, just about everybody I know knows someone, either in their family or friends in their larger uh, community, that's been affected by breast cancer. And this is very new. We received it in October of 2012. And um, as w with most people, I uh, know people in my family and friends who have been affected by this cancer. It is so uh, informative and it's presented in a clear language it's written so well and it's not um, it, it uses medical language but it's not uh, overwhelming uh, I had no trouble at all understanding uh, what they were discussing it, it talks about you know living with cancer it talks about uh, breast exams it has um, um, I would say hundreds of um, uh, pictures and tables um, uh, that help you uh, assess 
your decision making uh, and your doctor's, uh, uh, what you need to know when you go into the doctor's office. It gives strategies for talking to your doctor, strategies for the caregivers, what you can expect. Um, it's really comprehensive and uh, one of the reviews called it exhaustive, but it's not, a, it's not ponderous and um, I highly recommend this. Uh, the Mayo Clinic, which is, uh, you know, worldwide uh, reputation, breast cancer book. So um, I'm going to actually take this home and do more reading because I, I know people who have gone through this. Well, I think the Mayo Clinic, they have a series of books. They're, they're always, well, now going back to the other two books, though, you're, for a self-admitted cat person, you're... You're giving the dogs a lot of love today. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well, I love other people's dogs. Okay. That's what I say. They're just run. too much uh, care for me. Okay. Well, my next book is a book, again, like the book I just mentioned, getting st stupendous reviews. I, here's another one. Every review I read said this book is really good, but I haven't run into anyone that's read it yet. It's called Reinventing Bach by Paul Eli. Now, Zena, the author here, Paul Eli, I have a good question for you. <laughs> Do you know where he's from? No, but it must be he's from around here, right? He's from Colony, New York. There you go. He went to Shaker High. He wrote a wonderful book, which I read, where he, he wove together the lives of four famous um, Catholics in their spiritual quest, Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, Flannery O'Connor, and Walker Percy, and she sort of wove their lives together in their, on their spiritual. It was a really a wonderful book. It was called The Life You Save May Be Your Own. And he, so this is his newest book, again, Reinventing Bach, a colony native. Um, what this book does, again, he weaves a lot of strands together, not for different people, but he goes through the life of Bach and how Bach was re, has been reinvented through modern technology with all the um, recording. But he, it's also a history of recording going back to the 20s and 30s and 40s. And he, he goes through, I mean, this is what I'm, I'm only going by what I read, but apparently he's able to weave all this stuff together because I guess Bach himself was a great pioneer in working with organs and different instruments and being sort of developing new technologies for playing. So this book goes into the history of recording, 20s and 30s, up into the 60s with the Moog synthesizer. And he goes into a lot of the innovations with um, Albert Schweitzer, which I did not know, he was a big, Bach, a big organ guy. Uh, he um, I, I he was don't... played. He does something to do with um, Bach and organs. Those big, you know, massive. So Albert Schweitzer, I did not know he knew so much about music. He was also a theologian, and then, well, of course he well, was a missionary. Well, it's not unusual for math-oriented people to I be know. musical. Mm. So he also brings in Pablo Casals, Glenn Gould, um, Walt Disney's Fantasia. Um, Abbey, Abbey Road Studios is mentioned in here where the Beatles recorded. It goes into modern music. So he weaves this all together in uh, re not only reinventing Bach in a biography, but it's also a history of modern recording technology. Oh, and up into the audio CD age with Yo-Yo Ma's in here too. So and, um, the only thing I would say about this book though, it's, it'd be tough to read a book like this. But you feel like they, sh they should give you some CDs and say, CD After this section, in the section, play yeah. cut four, but <clears throat> I guess you have, to, you have to know a lot about the music to, to appreciate it, but all the reviews said this book is wonderful, and it's just sweeping, and it's appraisal, I guess you could say, of Bach and modern uh, recording techniques. So, Reinventing Bach by Colony native Paul Eli. Did he have a background in music? I don't I know. No, his, his background was he was an editor at Ferris, Strauss, and Giroux, and I, I, like I say, he wrote that book about the four Catholic writers. I, most of his articles, I see him in more like uh, really? religious kind of magazines. I'm not sure. This is his second book. He's currently a fellow in Georgetown. So it's just out of the, I mean, I don't know. It doesn't say anything about that he plays, in, plays instruments or was interested in music. But Seems I think he's a wide ranging Renaissance, uh, Renaissance guy. <laughs> Post Renaissance man. <laughs> Okay. Um, this is uh, fiction. This is a recorded book of a, a new title called A Cover of Snow. The author is Jenny Milchman. Um, uh, this is fiction. Um, that's why I chose it. I, Joe and I 
uh, try to come up with a fiction title now and then. Um, we both read fiction, but um, there's never, I'm never quite sure whether people are going to be interested in the same things that I'm interested in, even if they get, the books get good reviews in the fiction category. But I'm bringing this uh, to our audience's attention because it takes place in the northern Adirondacks. Um, it, it, in a very small town uh, in the middle of the winter um, and it's a mystery thriller and uh, it's supposed to be, the setting is close to uh, the Canadian border and uh, I was just thinking I never saw anything to indicate that the writer was uh, from this area or had actually lived in the Adirondacks but obviously she knows something about living in uh, uh, mountainous, snowy, uh, rural uh, America, um, and uh, the, that setting has a lot to do with the mood um, uh, in this mystery thriller, and I, I thought the, the, as a thriller, mystery, it's really good. Not thriller in the sense that anybody's dying or there's high-speed chases. I mean, that there's a lot of murders. There's just um, uh, this main character, her, she wakes up one morning and her uh, husband has committed suicide in the house they share in, um, as I said, in the middle of the winter in a rural area of northern New York. And uh, I just really enjoyed uh, uh, the book and uh, being read to me. I can't get a hold of the book because there are other people who have discovered it and it's um, a lot of reserves on it. Not, not a t tremendous amount, but enough so they couldn't get my hands on it. But so I'm recommending this for people who like mysteries because it has a local uh, touch. Um, Cover of Snow, Jenny Milchman. Oh, you you brought to our attention before. Is it all those Scandinavian authors? Um, yeah, uh, no, the Canadian the Scandinavian uh, authors are much more brutal, uh, okay. brutal murders and uh, brutal people. This isn't people. like that. Okay. No, no. Okay. There, I mean, there is a death, but and there is some bad stuff going on, but it's not a hor any horrible. Okay, well, we've already covered Russia in the 20th, in 20th century, so I have a book here on the other big, what's the term? China? The other, yes, China, the other big Ma 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 totalitarian dictatorship, <laughs> communist. Um, this book just came out, again, getting really good reviews. Actually, when it was published in China, well, I shouldn't say, it hasn't been allowed to be published in China. It was published in Hong Kong in two volumes. This is sort of a condensed. It's called Tombstone, The Great Chinese Famine, 1958 to 1962, by Yang Jisheng. Um, again, I was just skimming it. I've read, some, I've read like three or four different reviews, long reviews. Apparently, it's, it's very sad, very disturbing. You know, when uh, Mao, the great leap forward in the late 50s, you know, they, all this um, statistics about um, industrial production and all the peasants on the countryside. Well, I don't want to say they were, I don't know if they were left to fend for themselves, but they, everything had to be done toward the great leap forward, and a lot of people starved, apparently. This book says an estimated 35 million Chinese people starved between 1958 and 1962. And this is pre, then the Cultural Revolution came, and I don't know how many All millions. these experiments. Yeah, and the, um, the, author, the author actually is a Chinese journalist, and he's still a member of the Communist Party. He, he had heard stories about the famine. He didn't really know. He thought when his father died when he was younger of starvation, or not, I don't know if he died of starvation, but I think when he was a kid, there, was some, there, was a, there wasn't much food, but he never really, because he was a kid, he didn't think of it. So years later, he went to investigate his father's death, and he sort of came across some things, and he... He wasn't really sure what to say, but I mean, he sort of kept to himself. But then after Tiananmen Square, he decided that he could, he could no longer really sort of be the party, um, what's the word, follow the party line. So he researched, because he, he kept hearing about the famine and if it was, perp was it on purpose or whatever. So the author went, he did like 20 years of research. I think he was pretend, not pretending, he, he went around saying he was doing research on the grain harvests for all like decades and he was looking into all kinds of stuff but really he was doing research on the famine and I, he uncovered this amazing story I mean uh, some of the reviews I read this book said this is a very important book it had, like I say it hasn't been allowed to be published in China so 
you know, and it happened in Russia too in the 30s. Stalin, again, with the forced collectivization, they, they also, a lot of um, people starve there. Some say, and once you get into tens and 20 millions, I mean, it's, it, what can you say? I mean, so this book, a uh, very important book from what I've read, is called Tombstone, The Great Chinese Famine, 1958 to 1962. Really, I read some great reviews of this, but a real, a real um, sad chapter of history, but that's the 20th Being century. Being exposed. Yes. Bringing to light some of the past mistakes. Yeah. Let's. Here we go. Mistakes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is called Gun Guys, A Road Trip by Dan Baum. Now, Dan Baum, he uh, identifies himself as a stoop-shouldered, bald-headed, middle-aged Jewish, Jewish Democrat who's uh, consumed with um, uh, guns. And he loves guns. And he describes how uh, contradictory that is in his own life and uh, how he tries to explain himself to his friends and family and cohorts. And uh, he explains how he uh, went to summer camp when, for the first time when he was five. Does he live in a rural area? No, he lived in Long Island, New right. York City, Jewish Democrat, middle-aged. No, let me see. I but where think he's New York City. But where does he live now? Uh, I think he's New York City. Okay. East Coast progressive. Okay. Who's also a gun <laughs> enthusiast. That's how he defines himself. All right. And he, he describes how when he was five years old in a summer camp and he couldn't keep up with, um, uh, in the sports, with uh, any of the games, uh, he was a real dud. So they taught them how to shoot guns at the age of five in a summer camp he went to, and he was a sharpshooter right from the get-go. So from then on, he was in love with guns. Now he undertakes a road trip, in effect, uh, around the country, in different parts of the country. He goes to uh, Kentucky, New Orleans, Detroit, Chicago, Hollywood, Nebraska, and he talks to all sorts of gun owners and uh, to find out exactly what the, um, the attraction is to these people, uh, for these people, to the gun guns and gun culture. Now, he says himself, Dan Baum, he said he straddles, uh, you know, gun culture, but he's not really part of it. And so that's what he wanted to do, was try to immerse himself in different parts of the gun culture. And so he describes uh, people's uh, uh, defensive posture um, once, uh, for a long time, but uh, particularly since Obama came into uh, the presidency and um, he, in effect, is, a, uh, is saying that guns can be uh, a really wonderful um, leisure activity. He's not a big hunter, but he, he, does, uh, he does like guns. He likes shooting guns. He's very good at it. And so he, he describes the tension in the, in the United States between uh, uh, the um, urban uh, progressives, rural um, people who, who embrace uh, all aspects of the gun culture. But it's very, uh, it's very timely and it's very well written. And he uh, presents the, the words, you know, the language of uh, the people he, he interviews and uh, in all sorts of different circumstances. And uh, so he's, um, it's a very interesting perspective. Uh, and because of its timeliness, I highly recommend it. Dan Baum, Gun Guy, Gun Guys, A Road Trip. So does he, he likes shooting? Is that yes, he likes, he really likes shooting. He's a gun I mean, like, collector. Like target practice. He's a gun collector. And, um, you know, he, he says that while he understands um, gun control, the need for gun control, he also thinks that uh, we shouldn't. We should be careful in how we um, uh, undermine mm -hmm. our efforts to make gun, you know, gun yeah. safety. Because every time we talk about gun control, the people who who like guns uh, dig in and uh, yeah. you know. Okay. Well, one of my all-time favorite authors. He's in my top, either top five or top three. Joseph Epstein, the essayist, is one of my all-time favorite authors. He has a new book out 
a collection of essays on one subject. It's called Essays in Biography. So they're all about individuals. But Joseph Epstein, if you know him, he used to be, he was the editor of, now I can't think of the magazine, for like 30 years. Um, I can't remember now. But anyway, he's, all the collection of his familiar essays, he writes on things as, he, he can write on something about going around the, going around the block for a walk and just, you know, stuff like that. Ruminate, yes. Or he, or he, and he has a lot of books about uh, literary essays, of, um, literary criticism about books and authors, and they're, 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 they're great. They're, and he's got an incomparable style. He's a wonderful writer. And he's got four little books on different, um, I guess they're not virtues. One is. He has a, a, I mean, you may have seen these little books in the library. They're little short books. One's on gossip, the untrivial pursuit. One is on envy. One is on snobbery. They're, they're, like, they're kind of tongue in cheek, but he brings in all kinds of, of, of other sources for the topic, of, from literature, from movies, from films, from, from everything. And he has one on friendship. The friendship book was, was really good. We did it in our book group. So um, he has a short little um, biography of Fred Astaire. He writes about Henry James, his two favorite authors, two of his favorite authors, he always, he's always bringing in, this will give you an idea of where maybe he's at, Henry James, and Willa Cather are two of his favorites. Isaac Beshev Singer, he's he's widely read in history and the arts, and he's a now, wonderful are these writer. Essays, uh, have they been uh, published in? Other these have all been published in other places. Okay. but they're on they're on such a wide range of people: George Washington, Adlai Stevenson, Henry Luce, Ralph Ellison, Saul Bellow, Gore Vidal, Irving. So you get the idea. A lot of literary people, but he does have some other people in here. Um, Arthur Schlesinger, he has a little article on. Then he has a little section here on people from England, uh, just T.S. Eliot, George Eliot, Max Beerbaum, Hugh Trevor Roper, I think he was a historian. Then he's got a bunch under popular culture. He's got an essay on Malcolm Gladwell, the New Yorker writer, Michael Jordan, W.C. Fields, Alfred Kinsey. So you get the idea. And then he has a little section about the book about the rest, uh, miscellaneous. But a wonderful writer, if you don't know Joseph Epstein, get his familiar essays and just read those books. To give you an idea of his style, I'll read the first sentence of two essays, and then you can probably see where he's at and who, <laughs> who he might like and not like, I don't know. But a wonderful writer, like, like I say, one of my top three or five favorite authors. This is the first sentence of his, es of his essay about Irving Kristol. Um, the, I think he was a big editor of Commentary Magazine, father of... Conservative. Bill. Neoconservatives, I think he yeah. was. Neo. But anyway, right, this is the first sentence, and this will give you an idea of his style. As the last of the New York intellectuals depart the planet, it becomes apparent that Irving Kristol, who published less than most of them, had a wider and deeper influence on his time than all of them. So that gives you an idea of how he writes. It's, he's really... And here's, his, here's the first sentence on, um, oh wait, that Irving Crystal essay, was, the title was called The Genius of Temperament. And here's the first sentence of his essay about Susan Sontag, entitled The Very Public Intellectual. So it says, Susan Sontag, as P.R. Levis said of the Sitwells, belongs less to the history of literature than to that of publicity. So, so he's a really great writer, whether he's writing about literature, um, world novels, world, world uh, novelists, or he's writing about Michael Jordan or Fred Astaire or movies of the 40s, stuff like that. Um, I think now he must be getting close to 80. Is that Epstein with Joseph one P? Joseph Epstein. P, one P? Yes, essays and biography. We have most of his books in our library. All his literary essays, all his familiar essays. They're great books. You should try him if you've never read try him. Try it. I will. I'll try it. This book uh, is called uh, The Bomb. It's just called Bomb by Steve Schenken. Now, uh, the subtitle is The Race to Build and Steal the World's Most Dangerous Weapon. And they're talking about the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima in Japan. Um, this book was brought to my attention by one of our uh, uh, young adult uh, children's librarians. Um, uh, it won uh, a National Book Award for young people's literature last year, and uh, so I decided to take a look at it. 
and um, he, I guess, has written previously a book called The Notorious Benedict Arnold, which also got uh, rave reviews as well. Again, it's supposed to be uh, geared toward uh, grades, um, I think it said f uh, 7 through 10. But I have to tell you that I found this uh, really, um, I found it very interesting and it's certainly good for uh, any adult who uh, doesn't know the topic of uh, how the atomic uh, bomb uh, as a weapon was conceived uh, in the U.S. and uh, the race um, the, that was going on between the New Mexico, I'm trying, now I just lost the, what it was called. The Manhattan uh, Project. Manhattan Project uh, and uh, how they were trying to uh, subvert the efforts by the Germans to be building uh, an atomic weapon at the same time. Uh, during World War II. It, it uh, is written as a suspense story because he interweaves three, story, three stories, uh, the stories of um, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, scientists uh, and citizens who were uh, s selling or giving uh, atomic weapon secrets to uh, Germany and the Soviet Union and uh, spies, quote unquote, in Norway who were trying to subvert the uh, building of atomic weapons by the Germans in Norway during World War II, as well as the development of atomic bomb and Oppenheimer's uh, Manhattan Project in uh, New Mexico. And so it's actually not a long book, and it's got lots of white, white uh, space, um, so it's uh, easy to read. There's pictures of the uh, photographs of the main characters. It's all true. Um, it's just written in a very uh, a narrative, suspenseful manner, and uh, because of that, I can understand why it won its award, that award, and I also think that a lot of adults would be interested in, in this as well. So the bomb, it's just called bomb, not okay. the bomb, bomb so you, by Steve Shank. So even though it's geared toward teens, you find yes, it? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, I've tried a couple of books about I, Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project, mm. and they're too dense, too technical, too detailed for me to, for me yeah. to read. I'm, I, you know, I read um, uh, more, uh, in a more shallow manner than you do. <laughs> oh, stop, stop. <laughs> and uh, so I, I think a lot of adults would be interested in this as well. Well, this is a little bit off the topic. I don't have it with me, but, you know, um, I feel that the English playwright, is Brian Friel, wrote a play called Copenhagen, which is this imaginary conversation between Niels Bohr and, I think, Oppenheimer. And we just got it in. Oh, um, I do remember that. I, we just got it in the L.A. Theater. Where I've been talking about L.A. Theater Works. Done before live audience um, is fantastic, and Alfred Molina is, is plays is in it, but really great play. I don't, I can't show it, but all right. Let me end with this, or do you want to do one no, more? No, it's okay. Go ahead. Well, we have the latest in the Library of America, the final two volumes on the complete works of Philip Roth. I have two of them here. We have the other seven, even though we have all of Philip Roth's novels, multiple copies. You know, here and there, they do well. This is a uniform edition, Library of America, the eighth and ninth, and it completes his canon of works, you could say. This one covers this is novels 2001 to 2007, The Dying Animal, The Plot Against America, Exit Ghost. This one's called Nemesis, which comprises his four short novels that he wrote. His last four books were short novels, 200 pages or so Every Man, Indignation, The Humbling, Nemesis. So, um, and they're, they're, like I say, you, you can see him on the, on the shelf there. Philip Roth is only the second, he was only the second American to be published by the Library of America while he was alive, or well, he's still alive. Saw Bella was the other, but he died. So, but it, a, a volume came out before he died. But the Library of America publishes America's greatest writers throughout history, so it's obviously they don't have too many that are alive, but um, anyway, these are the latest. And Philip Roth, one of my all-time favorite novelists, um, his penetrating insights into the human condition are beyond anything I've ever read. I've, I'm almost through with almost everything Philip Roth has read or has written, so I'm making my way through them. Well, I got a couple left, but uh, he's an amazing author. He may not be. We were talking before we started. I mean. Uh, 
some people, women don't find him particularly what attractive or there's they, that word. <laughs> he's not. I mean, but his he's his novels are great. I mean, yes, I I understand maybe why women might not like him, but his novels are really good. You should. You may I'll like, try you may a like more. a few. But I should try a couple more. Of course, more. he maybe started. I'll try his short. Um, these short novels um, are they're they're very good. I mean, particularly Every Man and Nemesis were were great. So, Philip Roth turns eighty. I think this month, we're filming this in early March. The look so. of the cover is different? Yeah, the covers, that, all nine covers are different. It just the, looks different. They um, have, you know, the one, the one that has um, Goodbye Columbus and Portland has complained is when he's obviously a young man. So each of the covers are as he's ages because they kind of go, in, they're all in chronological order. So these are the latest in the Library of America's complete works of Philip Roth. So now they're done. Because he, as you know, Philip Roth wrote an article of a m month or two ago saying how he's given up. He's done writing. He's turning 80 and he's had enough. So, And there was great comments on it. Actually, this month on PBS is going to be a special about Philip Roth. So oh, I can't wait to I'll look for that. I can't wait to see that. So do you have any more? No. I'll well, as usual, we didn't get to all our books. I have a lot of stuff here I'll get to next time. If you're following the HBO Parade's End, we just got a whole bunch of new ones in. Yeah, I own. Parade's End was actually four novels together, so that this is all in one volume. If, and you're, if you're reading that, if you like Downton Abbey, this is a more, this is less glitz, um, more character development. Yeah, That's got, what I understand. It's got a good read. The Parade's End in HBO got a great review in the New York Times. So there's something about that pre World War One. Well, era in England that people really the world changed. Can't well, get even yes. the Russian uh, <laughs> the other revolution. book was yes, right. The Russian Revolution. Yeah, 1900, 1900 to 1925 is a fascinating massive um, change. era in all over the world. So that is it for this time, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>